Hello, this is Christopher Peterson. Hi, this is Sandy Powell. And we're the costume designers for The Irishman. And we want to spend some time taking you through The Irishman decade by decade. This is Notes on a Scene. During a film like this, it was so huge. There were so many costumes to actually do. Mm. There wasn't time to do drawings. You do a drawing if you're trying to work something out that's being made. But in, in this particular case on this film, we worked out what they were wearing by trying things on. Yeah, you actually work in 3D, really, to get it done. It's, it's, it's crazy, but I never understood how they would just keep digging their own graves, you know? I mean, stop! So this is Robert De Niro as Frank Sheeran at his youngest in the film. The real guy, Frank Sheeran, was, was much bigger than Robert De Niro, but there was no way we were going to make Robert De Niro actually six foot four. And so to help Bob, you know, he had some lifts in his shoes sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then also we sort of built up his shoulders a little bit to make him broader than he actually is, um, especially in the, in the younger scenes. Yeah. Yeah, just right in there. Oh, look, squared shoulders like that. He looks yeah. sort of slim and taller, but he's not necessarily going to look like your average 25-year-old. He's been at war for several years, and he's been through all kinds of trauma. Yeah, no, he was, and at this point, he was like a fighting machine. He spent something like 412 days on the battlefield of Anzio, so he was not to be messed with, which sort of sets up what's to come in the film. The 1950s are really where the story takes off. What's the problem, kid? I don't, I don't know, it sounds, it sounds funny. It stops, it starts, it loses power. Let me see if I can give you a hand. This is a really typical look for the 50s with Russell Buffalino wearing this gabardine jacket. Usually he's very smartly dressed. So this is sort of casual, but it's still really smart and very typical of the period. And it's the first appearance really of a bold tie that we used a lot on, on this character. And the boldest ties are sort of most typical of of the 40s into the 50s, yeah. and then later on you'll see that the Thai silhouettes start narrowing. I owe you anything? No, no, you don't owe me anything. Look at the Thai! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean, the, the 50s, the, the shoulders broadened out and you know, it got a little bit boxier, a little bit longer than the 40s. I mean, because all of the, the 40s suits and silhouettes on men, they were much more abbreviated because of the war and fabric rationing and just the style of the time. But once um, everybody came home, there was a bit more money and everyone went a bit more adventurous with how much they'd spend on clothing too. The look for Frank here is his very sort of typical teamster look. It's a leather jacket that a young man of his age in this period would be wearing, especially somebody who does a job driving around all day. And the cap also was very typical of a sort of teamster. You should Instagram that. A lot of people are going to appreciate what you did today, Frank. You know, you've got families, you got kids. They need those jobs. This is the first time that Frank comes to the Villa de Roma. Mm -hmm. The first time he's introduced to these other characters that are around. And what's, what's important here is the Harvey Keitel character, Angela Bruna, who really is, of everybody in the room, the sharpest dresser, really. I mean, he's, he's, the boss. He's, he's kind of the oldest, he's been around, and he knows how to dress. And then the skinny razor, who's always sort of very natally dressed. This is sort of the earlier end of the 50s, and as we go through the 50s, you see how, how the silhouette changes as it heads towards the 60s. So, mm -hmm. although the 50s starts out with a wide lapel for the guys and a wider tie, and as it gets through the decade, for the, for the younger characters, the lapels go more narrow, and so do the ties to sort of fit with the proportions of the suit. And also like the women, which echoes all of that. The skirts are wider, there's just, there's more volume in them and then it gets skinnier and it for gets, them. And it gets smaller, everything gets smaller and, and neater towards the end of the 50s as we go into the 60s. I just want to draw hearts. Close to Barney Motomorum. Born, eh? Yeah. So Sandy and I developed this capo collar which is a long spear point called just very typical of these men from the 50s. And it's a memory from M Marty's childhood. And this collar was sort of an exaggerated thing that, you know, kind of made men war. And you saw this collar and you understood that he was somebody not to be messed with because it was a, a slight exaggeration. And it appears in other films as yeah, well. Yeah, except the collar is even more exaggerated in other films that Marty is known for, such as Goodfellas and Casino. But in this particular case, Marty wanted these guys to be less obvious and less dandified as the others. E come te ha insegnato a parlare l'italiano. 
This is Frankie in a suit, not at his sort of finest just yet. His jacket is a regular 50s jacket that would have been off the peg. At this point, that was his best suit that he would have worn to, to go to meet Russell Buffalino. His collar here is not as exaggerated as, as Russell's because he hasn't actually graduated to that level yet. The shirt's not just a plain white shirt. It's, it's a kind of like a jacket. It's a pale grey, isn't it, with, yep. a, with a jacquard print and a little tie. The tie pins, I mean, we had a lot of tie pins to deal with. Yeah. This was our only way of really providing embellishment or decoration on these guys was sort of tie pins, clips and uh, cufflinks. Dove? Well, this one is right at the beginning of the 60s, in 1961. All these guys, they looked so great. It was such a uniform. There are younger guys, but again, they're not fashionable. Now, there would have been some very fashionable young men around during this time who would have had longer hair, which these guys don't have at the moment. Yeah, and they're all wearing these pleated trousers, which really starts to disappear on men of this age in the 1960s. Yeah, it, goes it goes to a flat, flat front. front. These guys are still wearing a fairly sort of full leg pleated pant. And then all of these, these camp shirts, all of this shape is quite voluminous, which was an echo from the 50s, you know what I mean? That shape there. What's nice about this scene is that it's set in Miami in the summer, so it was our, our really only opportunity to get a bit lighter in tone and color. Things like colors uh, are always indicative of a period. Like the mustard yellows, like here, I think is, is you know, this guy here, is pretty 60s. There was an awful lot of research material available to us of actual events that really happened, including documentary footage of Hoffer in particular. Not so much Frank Shearer, and we just had sort of family photographs, but we had many photographs of groups of men like these in the scene that we can see here. There's nothing necessarily summing it up as archetypal 60s, but none of these guys are particularly fashionable. They're just ordinary guys, so they're in pretty ordinary clothes that they may well have had for several years. They all kind of like to do the same thing. And yeah. this whole, the whole reason they're holding this convention in Miami at the Deauville Hotel, I mean, it was a reason to take their wives on vacation. <laughs> Gorgeous. Beautiful. We're in the best of health. We love you. He's now being protected by the, the Bruno family, and he has become Hoffa's bodyguard, so he's sort of, a, you know, a made man. And then mm. we've moved now into, you know, this, this very skinny tie. Look at that tie, come on. Yeah, pretty good tie. I think he exudes more of a, a sort of a confidence here mm -hmm. that, that might not have, you know, been before. Kind of like good clothes do to you, don't they? You know, you're wearing something fabulous and you feel good, and so you, you kind of have a different aura. Yeah, and people treat you differently as well. Mm -hmm. Like to skate. Here, Russell is still sort of wearing his 50s look a little bit with a large pattern, along with his rather bold Christmas cardigan. And it's another good example of, of his characterful ties, except his tie is still a little bit 50s. It's a wider tie than Frank's wearing, because Frank's a younger man, so he's got a more contemporary, narrow tie. I heard you like to skate. What do you say? I kind of got the feeling in this scene that Russell's wearing his Christmas look under duress. I, I think so him too. Wear it, don't you? I think so too. Santa Claus left you a little something extra in there too. We're back in Miami again, although this time ten years later than we were before. Hoffa is having a meeting with Tony Pro, who's late, very importantly. Tonally, again, we're much lighter tones, softer colors, like the last time we were in Miami, which is nice. It was just always a relief to, to, yes. to have a change from the dark, somber-looking suits. The only time you do is when? When you want to see something. I know. When you want to see fuck you. Uh, That's the only time. Stephen Graham is fearless. He will wear anything. OK, so this is Stephen Graham in probably the most talked about outfit in the film. Easily. Actually. So many people have asked me if this outfit was in the script or if it's something that we just dreamed up. So should we tell them or should we? <laughs> well, yeah, <clears throat> no, let's keep it a secret. <laughs> so obviously it was written in the script that Tony Pro is wearing shorts because obviously, as we see, Hoffa gets very upset about that. But it, it didn't describe what kind of shorts and then the script was written before we knew who was going to be playing Tony right. Pro. So then we get Stephen Graham, who's fantastic. Fearless. And what we did was we just got about 100 pairs of shorts, 100 different shirts, and, and had a, a session where we tried on lots of different shorts, lots of different shirts in various combinations. And we hit this one sort of fairly early on, actually. 
Um, um, and kind of knew that it was right. It was just you, you, the, the two, the shirt work with the, with, the, with the pants. And then at a later point, we found the fabulous white Gucci shoes. It came together. And, and of course, once we had tried on all of those things, we really, I mean, we chose the boldest, I think, of all yeah. of them, right? Yeah. Leave this weather, Frank. Huh? It's 85 degrees Ooh. outside. Hoffa is wearing, you know, Hoffa, you know, always wears a suit. He's pretty well turned out all the time. But this is this is sort of a more of a casual looking suit for him, even mm -hmm. though he's wearing a suit because it's a meeting. Mm -hmm. It's hot, but he's still wearing a suit, and he's actually still wearing a tie. But it's it's just a lighter tone for him. At this point, we've you know we're in the middle of the seventies, so we've moved into, you know, the, the polyester s fabric in the suit and the much wider and the tie, m much wider lapel like this. Whereas before we had, a, you know, a narrower lapel like that. And then, you know, to go with the, the wider lapel on the jacket, we get the tie gets much wider as well. Yeah. Why? It's summer. People aren't freezing to death in New York. It's summer. We found the perfect shirt that was a vintage shirt, but because Immediately after this moment, there is a scuffle, a fight on the floor. We had to, to make more than one because we had to do one for a stunt double, even though we didn't use a stunt double, did we? He did his own stunts. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let anybody but do But we stunts. had to do, we had to make multiples. So we had to recreate this shirt. So we had to copy the print of the shirt and did digital prints to replicate it exactly and then made multiples. And the same with the shorts. I think it's quite funny that he's, he's wearing it like open right down to here so we can see his chest. So it's, it's kind of even more disrespectful. And anything that is decided like this, the actor has to feel comfortable. It might have been his idea. We would have to agree. And then equally, Marty would have something to say if he, if he disagreed. But I think this was one of the looks he really loved. Yeah, sunglasses are fabulous. Mm. Again, it's another sort of sign of his disrespect that he's not even taken his sunglasses off in the room. Sure. Whereas, look, you can see Hoffa's glasses has. on the table. And they're wonderful, because the, until he leans into the light, you can't quite see what are going on with his eyes. Yeah. Sometimes it's quite nice. You're late. And it was traffic. Yeah, it's traffic. <laughs> We've got a great crowd for Frank tonight, huh? Come on, give it up. This is the Frank Sheeran Appreciation Night. It was a dinner that actually happened in, at the Latin Casino in Philadelphia to honor Frank, because at this point he was a Teamster leader, the president of the local there. We're right in the middle of the 70s. There were hundreds of extras in this scene, all, mm -hmm. all sat down for the dinner. And this was the, our only opportunity to do an evening work. So in a way, it, it's kind of the most glamorous scene. It's the most sort of yeah. dressed up, done up. So we had women with like hairdos and sparkly dresses and men all dressed up rather smartly. Yeah. <laughs> this was our one moment of glamour in the and, entire film, really. And glitter. And glitter, there's some sparkles, there's actual sparkles going on here. <laughs> they were meant to be the gold diggers because the gold diggers were there at the actual Frank Sheeran Appreciation Night backing up Jerry Vale, a very popular singer from the time. Again, there was a, a lot of research about what these women wore and so Sandy and I did an amalgam of a bunch of different outfits and came up with these. These lovely uh, white catsuits. We wanted to have something with movement and I thought, well, you know, fringing would be great. And this fringing actually that sparkles and is sort of like crystal but plastic is, is actually made from those sort of fringe curtain things that you get that you put in doorways, um, cut up into strips and then, and then <laughs> attached to the bras of the girls. There was one point in our workroom where there were, I think about 12 people sitting around two different table hand individually putting each one of these crystals in the center of the daisies. This is just all bare skin here, but it looks sometimes like maybe there's a fabric there, but it's just the fringing dropping off the edge of the bra. Oh, yes, the, the 70s were heavy, there were a lot of sequins, a lot of sparkle, but I think, you know, for evening wear in particular, I mean, I think you get a bit of glitter whatever period you're in. I can't believe we're talking about glitter in the Irishman. I know, I can't either. We should we have had more glitter. Well, this <laughs> is the thing, is the next time... If we had more glitter. Yeah, just like VFX, like a some kind of like glitter lapel. A glitter want, edge. A glitter edge. On offer. Frank that, could have a sort of few sequins on a tie. No, glitter gangsters. I do, I, Marty might object, but, but you know, that's no, not. No, we can talk around. Gangsters and glitter. That's, now that's, you're talking. That's Irishman part two, <laughs> which will be four hours long. This is one of our biggest scenes in terms of crowd and background. The crowd is populated with, you know, gangsters and made men. I think this is real sort of bang on 70s. It's the silhouette, it's the size of the lapels and the collars on both the men and the women. And the colors, there are, there are colors that are so specifically 70s. The wedding dress is 
actually a dress that we found. It's, a, it's an original wedding dress from the 70s. Mm -hmm. The jacket that Bill Buffalino, the, the, the father of the bride, is wearing, we, we made along with the groomsmen, we made a set of matching baby blue jackets for them. For the time, actually, for the 70s. No, it's very this, typical. This is very typical. It's actually a pretty tasteful dress, you know, compared to some of the horrors that we saw in the research. It's true, it is. They're quite demure. These bridesmaids for, for 70s, I mean, they're quite demure, and they should be their bridesmaids. But retrospectively, we look back and we think, oh, God, this is, like, a bit ugly, isn't it? Mm. But there were much uglier looks than this back then. I mean, the fabric is a really synthetic, it's a really synthetic, no, it's not a polyester, it's, it's a, a synthetic jersey, isn't like it? Like Kiana. And it's actually quite difficult to find these fabrics now. You know, I mean, all these dreadful sort of synthetics that were in invented in the 70s, it took a long time to find this fabric that resembled those, those ones then. <laughs> Gary, I made a vow, remember? Remember I made a vow, Karen? Yeah, now I can't smoke on... Right. You may not have had a lot of lines, but there's something really interesting about the women and the Irishmen, because they sort of serve as like this chorus for watching all of this bad behavior that the men do. So they really were troopers to sort of like... Because they're in every scene, practically, mm. you know, that the men are in, somehow. The pants yeah. were a big thing, for sure. I mean, oh, yeah. starting sort of in the 60s, really. But they're on a road trip, they're sat in the back of a car, so, you know, we figured it's comfortable, it's easier getting in and out of a car with a pair of pants on than it is if you're wearing a, a skirt or a dress. OK, I think it's time for a draw-off. Huge sunglasses. Very typical 70s sunglasses. Always coordinating jewellery. Statement pieces, I'd say. The chain belts also were very, very Huge. typical. Going back to the proportions of lapels and ties, everything was getting wider, everything's getting bigger, like the, the, the sunglasses got bigger. And then, you know, every, everything sort of works proportionally. So if collars and lapels on women as well are getting bigger, then the, the jewellery sort of tends to get bigger to mm -hmm. complement that. <laughs> and pattern, you know, actual pattern and clashing patterns as well. And these are sort of Poochie-esque. They're not actually wearing Poochie, are they? But it's, it's Poochie-esque looks. Yeah. Famous designer in the 50s and 60s. And 70s. These are like the real housewives of Philadelphia. So we're not talking about, you know, going to, to Bergdorf's. We're talking about going to, you know, the local Philadelphia department store, and this is what they would have found. Poochie esque. Yeah. Cannot forget the handbag. Matching bags and shoes. Not huge bags, actually. Having said huge everything else, the bags weren't, for these ladies anyway, they'd have been sort of small, neat, and, you know, should match the shoes. And this actually is quite an expensive bag. Well, they both had expensive bags in this, in this sequence. That's a, that letter or bag. Yeah. Was a brand I mean, time. bags, as always, and, and still are, sort of a bit of a status symbol. Mm -hmm. That's how you can, you can sort of show your wealth with your, with your handbag. Mm -hmm. We are mid-70s. We're 75 here, aren't we? 75. Phil, you had a nice shop here. Yeah. If it's not good for you, it's not good for me. These ladies are wearing clothes that they would have worn in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, in their heyday. And it's mm -hmm. sort of like, well, like we all do, you sort of carry on wearing the clothes that you're most comfortable in at the time when you're most comfortable with how you look, I think. So they're, they're sort of slightly backdated, but looking really well put together. Quite often times, the decades sort of meld into one another. But then that's, that's true to say of the entire film, really. I mean, it's sort of, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we start in the, in the 40s, end up in 2000. It's actually quite difficult to tell when the, when the transitions happen. From you and me. But what about a baby spoon? What is she going to do with a baby spoon? They just have a baby. Ah. Ah. You've got it! Ah. <laughs> well, we're all falling apart right there in the freezing fucking cold. Stay, from here. Stay here another fucking 10 years, you'll beat me. This is them in prison in the 80s, and obviously we can see that they've aged considerably, and Joe doesn't even have his teeth in. So much focus has been on the de-aging process, and it's masterful what Pablo did, but it's at this point in the story where more traditional filmmaking techniques with hair and makeup and what we do with costume kick in. Like, for instance, you know, Joe is in a much more oversized shirt than he probably should be in here but it makes him seem more sort of lost in it all. Fragile and, and yeah. sort of... And we did a lot of the same things with Frank, although not for this scene, later when we get to the nursing home. Yeah. They're very vulnerable looking here, actually, and it's the yeah. first time you feel a bit of sympathy or empathy. I'll put a little piece there. Just a little piece, I guess. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> This is the opening of the film. 
which actually the scene takes place at the end of the film. In this shot, you see the watch and the ring. The ring was given to him by Russell Buffalino the night of the Frank Sheeran appreciation event. And then the watch was given to him by Jimmy that same night. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, it's, it's quite interesting seeing these at the very beginning because these are obviously, now he's at the end of his life in the nursing home. These are his two most treasured possessions, aren't yeah. they? And this costume was pretty much one of the really great photos that we had of Frank Sharon in this period of his life. And it just moved us so much. We thought, you know, we'd do everything that we could to do our version of what we saw in the photo. And it probably was the least expensive costume in the entire film, wasn't it? Maximum, like, $12.50. Because the components of it are one of his shirts from the 70s, a vest from one of his 80s suits, a pair of horrible fleece track pants that yeah. elastic waist pulled right Oversized. up. Oversized. You know, and sneakers that velcro down. And old man sneakers. Yeah, old man, old man sneakers. Yet, he's, he's got his, he still has his shades. He still has his bling. Yeah, has, his, has his shades and his ring and his watch. And even just by wearing the vest with the dress shirt and the, and the track pants sort of sets him aside from the other, the other guys in this nursing home. But even though he's sort yeah. of at the end of his life and, and sort of a little bit vulnerable, he still has a presence there. Would you say this is your favorite costume, Sam? I think, well, it, it's so funny because, I mean, we, we, I mean, how many thousands of costumes did we do? I and know. we spent hours and hours and hours in fittings with all of our actors, especially Bob, and this one took about, like, five minutes. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it kind of says such a lot, really. I think it's absolutely my favorite. Mm -hmm. And it's so quiet. It's such a quiet thing. It's not our showgirls, but it's very moving. When I was young, I, I thought house painters painted houses. <laughs> what did I know? I think the biggest challenge on The Irishman was the volume of it and wrapping our heads around these many decades that we, we yes, costumed. Yes, the sheer scale of it. But anything's possible. We, we achieved it, didn't we? Absolutely. <laughs> Just the album cover. <laughs> <laughs>